Hi, my name is Mimi and today I'm going to be interviewing someone really special, Mr. Terry Waite. If I describe the circumstances, I mean, I was in a, a dark room, sometimes below ground, sometimes above ground. Um, I was chained by the hands and feet to the wall. I slept on the floor. There was no natural light, because if I was above ground, metal shutters were put in front of the window. Um, there were no books and papers for a long, long time and no companionship, no one to speak with. When anyone came in the room, I had to pull a blindfold over my eyes. So there was, you know, you were pretty isolated. You can read about it. You can, in some instances, I was never trained to, as to what would happen if I was kidnapped. But I mean, I'd met dozens of people who had been ki kidnapped and I'd worked a lot with people who had engaged in kidnapping. But there was nothing that, can really prepare you for an experience of that kind. When you are actually kidnapped, you don't know whether it's going to be tomorrow that you're going to be released, or next month, or next year, or never. Mm -hmm. And every time someone comes through that door, uh, you always begin to wonder, well, is this the end? Because, you know, when I was kidnapped, there were people who were kidnapped along with me who never came out, who died, mm -hmm. whether they were murdered, or whether they were murdered by neglect, one doesn't know, and you never know. You know, people don't just kidnap for the fun of it. They do it for a reason, uh, and a political reason sometimes. Often it's, it's done by people, for example, who are feeling a strong sense of injustice, who've been pushed at the bottom of the pile, who um, feel that nobody's listening to them, Mm. Uh, who are trying to gain a position as a political organisation, whatever, lo loads of different reasons. So you must get to the, the reasons. And then you must begin to be able to try and find a way through this problem, which enables parties to the problem to walk away with their dignity intact. In other words, a face-saving situation. And there is nothing worse, in my, to my mind, than this ridiculous statement that's going around, war on terror, war on terrorism. What we want to do is really get behind it. Why do people behave as they behave and deal with the fundamental issues, the fundamental problems, mm. rather than dealing with the symptoms? If you go to a doctor and he diagnoses you, he looks at your symptoms, and he treats the symptoms, you're in big trouble. Mm. You've got to deal with the root cause and let the symptoms guide you to the root cause. Same with dealing with terrorism. You've got to be able to keep yourself alive within and stimulate yourself uh, mentally um, by that inner life and not allow your brain, for instance, to deteriorate. So, I mean, I wrote in my head. I wrote uh, novels in my head. I wrote my first book in my head without pencil and paper. I did a lot of mental arithmetic. Not that I'm any good at arithmetic, I'm hopeless at arithmetic. I've always been fascinated by arithmetic, but I've never been any good at it, unfortunately. <laughs> but I've always been fascinated by it. And the reason, you know, the reason for doing mental arithmetic was because it's a, mental arithmetic speaks, and arithmetic itself, and math generally, speaks about order and precision. And what I think the mind is trying to do there is maintain some semblance of order and precision in the mind so that you don't fall apart. And therefore, you do that in order to keep your mind together. In that solitary route, you're forced to do one of two things. You're either forced to take that inner journey, which can prove to be pretty useful to get to know yourself and not to have any bluffing about yourself. You know, so many people bluff about themselves and live a projected life, you know, mm. being somebody they're not. Mm. And if that cracks, then they fall apart. In solitary, 
you, you can do that, but it won't stand up. And you either take that inner journey and get to know yourself, or you fall apart. When I uh, came to meet my family, and particularly my children, four children, I mean, I didn't recognize my son. When I went in captivity, he was a teenager, a young teenager, 13 or so. When I came out, he was a young man. And I wouldn't have known him in the street. And uh, that, just for me, sort of hit me. And I thought, my goodness, what a lot has happened while I've been away. One is to make make some income. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a and that's a perfectly legitimate and reasonable thing to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's one thing. Uh, secondly, um, to make an account while it's fresh in your mind. You know, now it's a number of years ago, and it's not not so fresh in my mind. And I've forgotten if I pick up that book now, which I haven't read for years and years. But if I pick up it now and research, oh yes, yeah, I say. But I've forgotten that, because mm. the memory is a very, very tricky thing, you know. It's, if you're going to write, uh, I would say one key thing, keep a notebook, mm. record your observations at the time or as quickly as you can after the time. Now, I couldn't do that in captivity mm. because I didn't have pencil and paper. But as soon as I came out, bang, I got it on paper because I wanted to record for, the, for, that, for, for that reason. And I suppose there is a third reason, and that is, there is, although I didn't realize this at the time, but there is therapeutic value for yourself in getting the experience out of your mind, either onto paper or to tell it to somebody else who will be a good listener. Well, Hostage UK, really, is to be uh, as a supportive unit uh, to enable uh, people who have um, had a member of the family or a relative or friend or close someone close to them who's been captured to give them support first of all mm -hmm. if if for instance um, someone who was close to you was uh, taken hostage mm -hmm. uh, you would be bombarded in all sorts of ways. I mean, the press would be, would be at you. You would have communications from the Foreign Office. You would have a whole thing coming at you. You'd have, and you would also have your own personal circumstances to cope with. Let's say you were a young mother and you devoted your time to your children and the main uh, breadwinner in the family is taken hostage. Well, you've got the whole problem of how do you cope? Who do you trust? What do you say to the media? Do you speak to them? Do you, uh, do you ignore them? Do you, many hostage families, for example, many close friends or relatives of hostages, think, gosh, I must get out there where the person's gone and do what I can. And they often feel as though they're not doing enough. Now, there is no substitute in that situation for someone who's been through the experience of sitting down and saying, look, this happened to me and this is, how we dealt with it and these are some of the suggestions as to how you might deal with it. And that's one of the things that Hostage UK does for relatives and friends. I suppose one thing I would say is that uh, I'm still learning, I still value learning, and uh, I also have uh, benefited greatly from some of the experiences that I've had in life mm. and I've tried to turn the negative experiences that everybody gets to positive effect. Some I've been able to do that with and others perhaps not. Well thanks, it's been great interviewing you. Well, thank you Mimi. Thank you how, much, how did I mean, you enjoy it's been, that? It's yeah. really, really inspirational. I mean, um, 